And uh, tonight I'd like to welcome you guys to Spreading Confidence, the history of gambling and cheating. Tonight I'm going to take you on a journey through time, telling you about different games of chance. Some of the people who play them and why you just can't seem to win. Now some of these games you may have heard of before or even played, whereas others have been all but lost to the sands of time. Many of these games were invented for and kept alive by less than honorable gentlemen. You might refer to these men as scoundrels, con men, grifters, flim flat men, bunko steers, hustlers, or cheats. These people are my friends. Uh, you also may be surprised to find that a word or phrase from a game that you've never heard of before is part of your everyday vocabulary. And I'd like to start off this evening by telling you about a game called the Three Card Monty. Uh, unlike many games, this is one game that you don't have to go looking for. The Monty will come looking for you. Found on street corners and subways in major cities around the world. You might hear it referred to as follow the bean, find the lady, tossing the broads. No matter what it's called, you don't want to play this game. It's said that a good Monty tosser can take a crowd for hundreds, hundreds of dollars with or without the aid of a mob of, uh, mob of uh, Confederates in just a few minutes. So we better get started. <laughs> now, if you're not familiar with the game, uh, let's see, the game, uh, literary references to the game date back to around 1800 until they're being played on the streets of Paris under the name Bonnet II, which is French for little cap. Now, uh, if you're not familiar with the game, it's the one where you try and find the Red Queen as it's mixed with the two black aces. Now, some of you may have seen the monster, you may have even played it. If you played it, then you know that it's not you against the cards, but you against the man who's dealing the game. Which reminds me of one guy in particular. His name was Cleveland Joe. He used to throw money down on the south side of Chicago, down at Maxwell Street and Halstead, back when it was a real street market. And I only saw him twice, but I'll always remember he's the guy who played three-card Monty with four cards. He called this little game of looky loo, three for me and one for you. But fighting the red queen as it's mixed with three black aces is the tougher out to beat. And so of course the payoffs were bigger. But there was always some joke in the audience who would say, excuse me, but uh, isn't that game supposed to be played with three cards instead of four? Old Joe is always happy to oblige. He says, well, you can play with four, you can play with three. Just keep your eye on the little red queen. Hey, diddle diddle. She's the one in the middle. And he would do his fancy little shuffle, and people would bet on where they thought the queen was. But you see, it didn't matter which card they chose, because this guy was good. In fact, he was real good. You might even say he was too good. You see, he was cheating. Now, I watched him all afternoon. I figured out what he was doing. He would wait for somebody to say, isn't that game supposed to be played with three cards instead of four? Always happy to oblige. He says, well, you can play with four, you can play with three. Just keep your eye on the little red queen. Hey, diddle diddle, she's the one in the middle. And when he did his fancy little shuffle, he made a move like this. Did you see it the first time I did it? Yeah. See, that's the switch. That's how it's done, because after he makes his move like that, it doesn't matter which card you choose, because by that time, the queen is no longer in his hands. By that time, the queen is in his coat. So I figured I had this game all busted out. I went home and I gathered up all the cash I could lay my hands on. I went back down to Maxwell Street, and I snuck into the crowd, and as soon as he started, I said, Now, wait a minute. Isn't that game supposed to be played with three cards instead of four? Old Joey looked at me, and he smiled. He says, Well, son, you can play with four, you can play with three. Just keep your eye on the little red queen. Hey, diddle diddle. She's the one in the middle. And he did his fancy little shuffle, and he says, Where is the lady now? Well, he made his move, so I made mine. I stepped up to his table, I laid my money down, and I said, The queen is in your coat. Old Joe, he looked at me and he smiled. I learned three things that day. I learned you should never play cards with a man named after a city. That you should never try and con a con man. <laughs> and that a fool and his money are lucky to get together in the first place. All right. So that is what they call the three card Monty. Now next up, I'm gonna open up my office here. When I go to work, I have to take my briefcase. <laughs> because I want to tell you guys about a game called Fast and Loose. Now, Fast and Loose is a carnival-type gambling game dating back to the 14th century. Shakespeare mentions it in his play, Anthony and Cleopatra, where he wrote, Like a night gypsy hath at Fast and Loose, beguiled me to the very heart of loss. He mentions it again in a play called King John, where he wrote, Play fast and loose with fate, so just with heaven. Now the game has gone by many different names down through the ages. 
including on the barrel head, the endless chain, picket the loop, pricking the garter, pin the girdle, and grandma's necklace. But its original name, Fast and Loose, in my mind at least, describes the game the best. Either the chain will hold fast and you win, or it will come loose and you lose. It's a 50-50 proposition. Now to this day, the expression playing fast and loose means to be reckless. So if you guys are feeling reckless, I'd like you to come up, join me at the table here. Now even though the odds are even, I still feel that I have an advantage in the game. You see, through my experience in the game, I'm able to predict the behavior of the players through applied psychology and common patterns of guessing. I have confidence in my ability to make you pick the wrong side, and this is a confidence game. Now, since uh, I don't want to take unfair advantage of you guys, I'm going to give you the chips to bet with. Since there's no way of cashing them in and no uh, real money on the table, the local constabulary shouldn't have a problem with us playing. But before we do it for, for a chip, why don't you try it once just for fun? Put your finger in either side. That side right there, look at that. Now see there, she won. Give her a big hand, she did very good. Remember what that feels like, because it's the last time it's gonna happen. Okay. <laughs> so what I do is I just take the chain, I lay it out here. Sir, you wanna give it a try real quick? Put your finger in either side. That's, I'd go with the other side. You would. I Okay. You know, I try and help some people out, but they just don't want to. That's going to be, that's gonna be one, yeah, that's going to be one of mine. So, uh, there you go. We'll let you try it once. Put your finger in either side. I'd go with the other side. You know, it's not that you can't trust me. You just have to know when to trust me. Remember, there was a chip on the line this time. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you what, I'm going to make it as fair on you guys as I possibly can. I'm going to have you both put a finger in. As I do, as I pull the chain towards me, I want you to move your fingers closer to each other slowly. Okay? That's perfect. Now, one of you is going to feel that your side is going to hold fast. If you think yours is the side that's going to hold fast, you stay in. But it's going to cost you your chip to play. The other person takes their finger out. So we Ah! <laughs> it looks like your side went a boom. Oh, I'm sorry, but uh, you can, now see, now you can relax and watch me clean him out. Okay? Make takes all the pressure off of you. There you go. There you go. We're gonna lay the chip now. And you only have the one chip left, so I'm gonna make this as fair as I possibly can for you. Not only am I gonna let you pick either side, but I'm gonna let you call it. If you think it's gonna hold fast or it's gonna come loose, if you call it correctly, you win. So uh, only one finger. <laughs> That's right. I'll see it'll come loose this time. You think it'll come loose on that side? So if that side holds fast, I win. You win. Okay. He thinks I'm trying to use double reverse psychology on him. You know, you sure you don't want to change your mind? I'm relatively sure. You're happy with the mind you have. All right. Well, let's see what we've got here. Oh, would you look at that? Well, it's been a pleasure fleecing you. <laughs> And that is what we call fast and loose. Thank you for coming up and playing my game. <laughs> All right. That will leave me some room in your office. <laughs> That's right. Now next up, I'd like you guys to picture a scene of a saloon in the Old West. You walk through the swinging doors and what do you see? A couple of dusty prospectors sitting at the bar drinking whiskey, guy over in the corner at a player piano. Exactly right. Maybe some ladies in the evening up on the balcony, and a bunch of guys are sitting around playing cards. And what game were they playing? Poker. Poker. Everybody says poker, and poker was played in the Old West, but was not nearly as popular as Pharaoh. That is correct. In the Old West, the game that was popular back then was called Pharaoh. Now, this is what a Pharaoh layout looked like. It had all the cards uh, shellacked inside the, the tabletop. I had mine put on here. Now, uh, your misconception is not your fault. From the early 1940s to the mid-1970s, Pharaoh wasn't portrayed in Westerns. Western-themed books, movies, and television shows all showed guys playing poker. It wasn't until John Wayne's last movie, The Shootist, in 1976 that a Western showed guys playing Pharaoh in the Old West again. Now, other movies and TV shows have since followed suit, though usually playing the game incorrectly. Pharaoh was respectfully nicknamed Bucking the Tiger because it was fast, wild, and exciting. 
many places that offered the game didn't even advertise it by name, but instead just had a picture of a tiger hanging out, hanging up outside. Uh, also, the, uh, the case that most feral saps were carried in was a mahogany box with a picture of a tiger on the side. Now, uh, a pharaoh setup consists of a bedding table called a snap because they sometimes had folding legs, a dealing box, a case keep, and a deck of cards. Cards were put, after they were shuffled, were put into the dealing box face up. The bottom card that you saw inside the deal, uh, the, bottom, the first card you saw was the bottom card of the shuffle deck, and that was a dead card called the soda card. After the soda card, you had the, the dealer's card, which was a losing card, followed by the winner's card, or the player's card, which was a winning card. Those cards were subsequently followed by losing and winning cards until you went through the entire deck. Now, uh, during its heyday, Faro was the most popular game in the country. More money was bet on Faro than all other forms of gambling combined, according to the 1882 New York Police Gazette. Uh, there's even a town in the Yukon Territory of Canada that's named after the game. Now, when the game is played fairly, the odds of winning are almost even. The problem was that hardly anybody played the game fairly. That's right. To make any real profit on the game, you had to cheat. Now, um, the guys like Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday made their living dealing the game. Uh, the way that the dealers would cheat was they would use a rigged feral box, like this really, really old one that I have. Now, this is not a rigged box. There are two kinds of boxes available, regular ones like this one and rigged boxes. A rig box could show the dealer what card would be coming up next, could deal two cards at once when desired, or could uh, deal the second card from the top uh, instead of the first. So this, this gave the dealer advantage in the game. If he knew what card was coming up and it was heavily bet, he could deal two cards at once, so you would never see that card. Now the players, known as putters, would bet on the game by putting their checks, which were like modern poker chips, on a card they thought was going to come up on the winning side before the losing side. They could also bet on a card to lose, but I'll tell you about that in a minute. Now the other way that dealers would cheat was they would, uh, besides using the rigged boxes, they would also sometimes stack the deck or shave down certain cards to make pairs come up more often. The only way that uh, if, a, if a pair came up, like uh, five on the losing side and the winning side, the dealers would collect half of the money that was bet on that card. This was the only way that the house had a legitimate 2% advantage in the game. By making pairs come up more often, they increased those odds. Now, um, the other piece of equipment that's commonly associated with the game is an abacus looking device called a case key, or coffin. This was used by someone sitting across from the dealer. And it would, every time a card was played, one of the, one of the pegs was moved. This helped the players strategize on what cards to bet on, and also kept them from betting on cards that had already been played out. Uh, any cards that were left on the table, at the, at the end of, uh, when you got down to the last four cards, unseen cards in the, in the dealing box, the, the, the last card in regular play was called the hot card. And any bets that were left on the table after the hot card was played were collected by the dealer and were considered in hot which is a phrase still used today by pawn shops. Right. After, after the hot card, you had three remaining cards inside the dealing box. If the case keeper had done his job correctly, you knew what order those cards were in and could bet on, which, on what order they would come up in, usually at four to one odds. Now this was a very exciting part of the game for the, for the players. The only problem was that sometimes the case keeper worked with the dealer. And even though it was dangerous for him, it was sometimes more profitable to take the blame if the dealer had dealt two cards as one, than to and, and, and uh, take the blame for the miscount, than to hope that the players would tip him if they won that final bet. Now uh, the, the players themselves were allowed to keep their own track of the game on scorecards called tabs, but uh, the game moved so quickly that it was difficult to keep your own track of the game and play. There wasn't really any profit in keeping tabs on the case keeper unless you were trying to catch him and the dealer cheating. But if the case keeper or the dealer caught you keeping tabs, he would simply pl score the, play the game fairly until you stopped. Now all of this added equipment is there to give the illusion of fairness, much the way the added security at the airport gives the illusion of safety. Now uh, the players, known as putters, 
uh, would, as I said before, would bet on a card that they thought was going to come up on the winning side before the losing side. They could also bet on a card to lose by putting a copper piece on top of their on top of their pile of checks. Now the copper pieces were originally pennies, but were later replaced with octagon-shaped pieces called a copper to mark a bet reversal. Now a cheating putter might try and cheat if the card came up on the winning side before the losing side and it was a copper bet, they might try and pull their copper piece off of their pile of checks using a thin, thin silk thread or horse hair attached to the piece. They also might try and cheat by attaching a hair to the bottom check on a pile of checks and if the card came up a loser, pull the entire bet to another card. Now, um, the Faro itself was invented in 1713 in France as a revised version of the then outlawed British pub game, Bassett. Although Faro itself was eventually outlawed in France, it had caught on back in England and was brought to the United States by French economists where it spread like wildfire because it was fast and when played fairly, the odds of winning were pretty even. If you ever read uh, Tolstoy's novel, War and Peace, uh, usually the thickest book you'll find in the library, one of the main characters tries to use a rigged feral game to cheat his rival into giving up the woman he desires. Now, a lot of people ask me, uh, whatever happened to a game like Pharaoh? Well, like all good things, the government got involved and tried to regulate things. Around 1900, there were nearly a thousand registered feral banks across the country. But by the 1930s, most gambling was outlawed in the United States, and the only legal place to play was in the state of Nevada. Even in Nevada, where the game was still legal, by the 1950s, there were only five active feral banks in the entire state. The last one closed at the Ramada and Reno in 1985. Now, people ask me if there's anywhere that you can play the game today, and the answer is yes and no. If you want to play it for cash, you're out of luck. But there are still a few period performers like myself who do reenactments of the game. And there's also a really fun website online called Wichita Pharaoh that's got cool uh, saloon background music and, and uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. So if you, if you ever get a hankering to play a game of Pharaoh, you can always just go online and check it out. Alright, and that is my presentation on the game of Pharaoh. Now next up, I would like to tell you about Roulette. Established casinos. 
uh, because they, they only had the one pocket which to mark the house advantage, which made lower house odds, but better odds for the player. Now they took their wheel to Hamburg, Germany, because at the time, uh, roulette was illegal in France, and it caught on big. Uh, by the end of the 18th century, or by the end of the 1800s, the uh, European wheel that the, the, the Blanc brothers had developed uh, became the premier game all over the world, except for, their, uh, except for the United States, where the single and double zero pocket remained dominant. Now, um, gambling legend tells the tale that the Blanc brothers made a deal with the devil in exchange for all the secrets to roulette. This is supported by the fact that if you add up all the numbers from 1 to 36, it adds up to 666. Now, uh, what's going to be known as American roulette, uh, because it's only played in the United States, South America, and the Caribbean, is a wheel with zero and double zero pockets. It's often misreported that the double zero pocket was invented here, when in fact it was the original casino version. Now, uh, cheating at roulette has uh, been around probably nearly since its conception, and uh, there's been some noteworthy examples by both the players and the house. Some, uh, some players that uh, were really uh, bold broke into a casino one night and actually uh, put uh, substances in some of the different pockets. They put sticky substances in some pockets and rubbery substances in others, so that the ball was more likely to bounce out of certain pockets and stay in other ones. Now, uh, the casinos have done their share of cheating also. Uh, a casino with a rigged roulette table were sometimes called juice joints because the roulette wheel had electromagnets built into different uh, four, four uh, electromagnets built into different parts of the wheel. The ball they used was a wooden ball, but it had a steel core. And when they turned on a switch under the table, the ball was drawn to one of the was drawn to one of the four four uh, magnets on a section of the table that was not heavily bent. Another way that they uh, would sometimes cheat was they would put a, a trip pin in the upper ball track so that when the ball was spun, it would hit the trip pin and immediately fall into a section of the, a section of the wheel that wasn't heavily bet on. You know, the, the dealer would control that. Now, um, <coughs> excuse me, there's a famous song about the night that Joseph Jagger broke the bank at Monte Carlo. Excuse me for one second. What really happened was that Jagger had hired a crew to record the spin outcomes on the wheels at one of the casinos in Monte Carlo. His crew found that one wheel stopped on one number much more than any other. He used this information to win himself $450,000 uh, before they caught on to what he was doing and readjusted the wheel. Now this was back in 1873 when $450,000 was a lot of money. So, you know, for the night he broke the bank, but you, you, know, you can't really break the bank at the casino because that's right, tomorrow's another day. <coughs> now, in 2004, a trio of uh, two men and one woman took the Ritz Casino in England for 1.3 million pounds over two nights. They did this using uh, what's called sector targeting and they, uh, to determine where the ball was going to land. And they did this using a laser scanner built into a camera phone. The laser scanner would record where the ball was when it was first spun and where it was again after its first or second orbit. They would then, uh, the, the, the uh, scanner was connected to a computer back in their hotel room and would use this information, would process this information and determine where along the ball's decaying orbit it would end up. Now, this was no easy feat because all of this had to be calculated figured out and bets had to be placed all within a few seconds. Now sector targeting wasn't really that new of an idea. In the early 80s, a gambling expert wrote a book on how to do it using a stopwatch. The casinos had combated this by banning stopwatches in the casinos. <coughs> now um, in the, uh, the mid-80s, um, a uh, bunch of casinos in England were sustaining heavy losses and uh, decided that one of the wheel manufacturers decided that he would redesign the wheel again uh, to what he calls a low profile wheel. Now this wheel had a more inclined ball slope 
I, I'm sorry, a less inclined ball slope and shallower pocket, so it was more hard. It was harder to determine where the ball was going to, because it would continue bouncing around even after a normal wheel would have stopped. Uh, it, it had a few other features too, but the low profile wheel proved very successful in, in stopping people using sector targeting. Uh, when the uh, when the uh, um, Golden Nugget in Atlantic City uh, lost uh, 3.8 million dollars to a crew using sector targeting, the casinos all over the world took notice, and within a year, pretty much every casino had transferred to the new low profile wheel. <clears throat> now there are some legal ways of uh, gaining an advantage in roulette that are not cheating. You can bet on even bets, like even, odd, red, or black. Uh, basically, it's almost a 50-50 percent for, your, for, for you. Uh, you can also improve your odds if you play on what's known as roulette, uh, uh, European roulette, but have only a single zero pocket. And if you can find a wheel with an uh, in, uh, in prison rule, that means that if, uh, if, if a roulette table has an in prison rule and you bet on red, and the ball lands on zero, which is green, you don't lose the bet, it just rolls over to the next bet. If it wins, you, you collect your money. If it loses, they, you lose. But the house advantage on this, on this bid, it's only 1.36%, which is very low odds for the house. <coughs> so that's, uh, that's what I've got under that. Next, uh, this is where I usually take an intermission. If you guys want to get a drink or use the restroom, or if not, I, I, uh, if, if people aren't uh, wanting to take an intermission, then I actually do uh, some proposition bets during intermission. You like proposition? A lot of people refer to them as bar bets because you're just as likely to play them for a drink as you are for the cash. I'm going to show you a couple of my favorite ones. This is actually one of the most popular parts of the show. Let's see here. We'll put uh, the bill on top of the bottle. Put four quarters on top of the bill. All right. All you have to do is get the bill out without knocking off the quarters. Couple of couple of rules. Can't touch the quarters. Can't touch the bottle. And can only touch the bill with one finger. Okay. You want to give it a shot? <laughs> I'll move it over here by your chair if you want to give that a try. You can only touch it with one finger. Now I actually know two ways of doing this. And I'm gonna let you I'm gonna let you look at it, try and figure it out.
covers it up. Now the reason I have you guys come up and examine this stuff, uh, the reason I need your, your assistance is because when you've got three nuts and you've got to pee, you need a lot of help. <laughs> You'll get that one on the way home. It's what I call a FEMA joke. You'll get it in a week to ten days. Now you may have heard of the shell game, uh, although the game has only been played with the shells within the last 200 years. Hieroglyphics depicting the game date back to the uh, date back to ancient Egypt and can be seen at the Great Pyramid of Giza, which is the only one of the original seven wonders of the world that still exists today. In Egypt, the game was, wasn't played with shells at all, but rather with scarabs. Now scarabs are bugs known as dung beetles. The female scarab would lay her egg sac in dung and then uh, roll it in, in uh, would lay her egg sac, roll it in the dung and make a hard protective shell on it. And then the male scarab would push it around as he scurried about and then cover it up with his body to protect it. Now, the, the, uh, this is about as interesting to, you, uh, to the slaves that built the pyramids as it, as it apparently is to you guys. So they would just bet on which bug had the little ball of poop under it. Now, the game continued down through recorded history and was played widely throughout Northern Europe uh, during the Middle Ages uh, with finger thimbles. The game was then called thimble rigging and uh, was played widely throughout Northern Europe. It's depicted in many paintings and books from that time period, and you can see it in museums around the world. Now, playing the game with shells instead of thimbles is largely popular because of men like Soapy Smith. Soapy was the king of the frontier conmen, the original American gangster. His gang of shell men, conmen, and thieves traveled around the country, eventually setting up shop in permanent locations where they could bribe local law enforcement to being left alone. Uh, so, uh, once when asked about his business dealings by a local newspaper, Sobey replied, I consider bunko steering to be as honorable as the life led by the average politician. Now the reason I had you guys come up and examine these things ahead of time is once we start the game, you don't touch the shells, you don't touch the pee, everything on the table belongs to me. Now so, uh, as I said, Sobey's uh, uh, exploits were so outrageous that to this day, uh, celebrations are held annually on the anniversary of the night that he was shot to death in a gunfight with a vigilante mob. Now today you may see the game played uh, on street corners and subways with little plastic bottle caps and wads of paper, but I still like the shells. The game's been very good to me over the years, and so I had mine cast in gold. Now it's a very simple game. All you have to do is keep your eye on the P. Do you see the P? Okay, very good. Now, uh, so, uh, once, once again, I'm going to give you guys some chips to bet with. This just makes it fun for all of us. All right? Okay. Very simple game here. Are you ready to play? Just move the shells around just like this. There you go. And you know what? We're going to let you try it for, for fun. We're going to let you try it for fun one time. Go ahead. Where do you think it is? That one right there. Now, I said you don't touch this piece. You don't touch. So you don't touch the shells, you don't touch the pee, everything on the table belongs to me. I do that because women sometimes will uh, touch their lip like this and then they leave lipstick marks on my shells. And they're so, they're so shiny and pretty, I don't want to think. Now what you were looking for is right over here. Okay? How about you? You want to give it a try real quick? Okay. All right. Let's see. There we go. Put a chip up by the shell you think it is. That one right there. Oh, I'm sorry. Actually, it's over here this time. You, you seem confused. You knew where it was? Good. So that time she knew where it was. Okay, so I want you to keep your eye on it just like this. All right. And there we go. Put your chip up where you think it is. That one right there. Well, your thinking is straight, but it's the game that's crooked. Now, what uh, the, the secret to this game is, you don't want to watch the shells. So you're watching the shells. I told you, you have to keep your eye on the P. All right? I'm going to show you how this works. What happens is, I move the shells around so quickly that you can't see what's happening. When I'm moving the shells around fast, there's no way that you're going to catch what's happening. So for you guys tonight, I'm going to do this half fast. Half fast is how my wife says I do everything around the house. Half fast. He'll get no, this on the way. Told, home. No, no, she's told me about that. She's told you about that. Very good. So you see, you see the pee there. All right. Watch this as I move the shells. You see how that happens? Huh? 
Well, maybe from your angle. Could you see it from your angle? I saw something. You saw something good. So put your, put your, you, so you know it's this one over here. Well, now you should listen to me. See, I actually know where the P is. <laughs> Trying to make this easy on you here. Now you only have one chip left, so I'll tell you what. I'm going to make it very simple for you. I'm going to put the P right there. You point to any one of the three shells. This one right here, I'm going to take that shell, I'm going to drop it over the P just like that. I want you to take this cut, the glass, I want you to put that over the shell. Very good. Now I want you to put your, I want you to put your thumb on top of there. Now that's your finger. It's, our, it's my fault I picked you. Which one of these two do you want for your second guess? This one you want for your second guess, put your finger on that one. That makes this one mine, okay? You ready? All right, tell me when you're ready. All right, say go. I win. I know. See for yourself. And that's what we call the shell game. called this machine the card bell because it still had playing cards painted on the reels and a bell that rung when you got a winning combination. A year later he repainted the symbols on the reels from playing cards to just card suits, including a star, a horseshoe, and a picture of a cracked Liberty Bell. This was the birth of the Fay Liberty Bell slot machine, whose basic design would be the standard for the next 60 years. A spin resulting in three Liberty Bells paid out at its highest jackpot, a grand total of 50 cents or 10 nickels. Now the machines were, uh, were uh, he would rent the machines to saloons and bars on a 50-50 split, and they were very popular. In fact, they were so popular that he couldn't, he, he couldn't build them fast enough in his small factory to keep up with the demand. Gambling manufacturers and distributors offered to buy the rights from him, but Faye refused to sell. He was afraid, and for good reason. A judge had ruled that gambling machines like his and the poker machines were not covered under U.S. patent laws because they offered no useful purpose other than to separate people from their money. Faye preferred to operate the machines himself and didn't want his competition getting their hands on one. In 1905, a Faye Liberty Bell slot machine was stolen from a San Francisco saloon. The only two things that were missing were the slot machine and a towel used to conceal the theft. Just over a year later, the Mills Novelty Company right here in Chicago put out their own slot machine called the Operator Bell. It had these still popular fruit symbols of lemons, cherries, and plums, and also had a bell that rung when you won. The novelty company's owner, Herbert Mills, was known as the Henry Ford of slot machines because he used assembly lines at his factory to produce thousands of them. Herbert really knew a good idea when he'd stolen one. Now, uh, after that, things didn't go that well for Charlie Fay. Soon other companies were making slot machines with his design, and then an earthquake in San Francisco flattened his factory. Add to that the fact that slot machines became illegal in San Francisco in 1909. They were illegal a year later in the state of Nevada, and by 1911, were illegal in the entire state of California. Now, he did still manage to uh, make a living redesigning the machines to fit the changing tide. 
Different companies should use various methods to obey the new laws. The Bell Fruit Gum Company was the first company to mass produce slot machines that dispensed gum for every pull of the handle. Winner! Cool. How about that? The Kelly Brothers slot machines all had a Swiss music box built into the base of their cabinets. This helped them obey the law by classifying the machines as musical devices. Now, in 1920, along came Prohibition. America outlawed the distribution and consumption of alcohol. This could have been the end for slot machines since most of them were located in bars and saloons. But uh, even though drinking was illegal, it didn't stop people from doing it, and the speakeasy was born. Now, since these places were illegal anyway, why have slot machines that dispense gum instead of cash? Slot machines were back and with a vengeance. Uh, even with um, all the government pressure, the operation of slot machines was hard to stop. In, uh, in July of 1950, uh, California passed a law that uh, charged a $500 fine for every slot machine in one's possession. <coughs> Excuse me. Six months later, Congress passed the National Johnson Act, which prohibited interstate shipment to illegal states. That, le that left Nevada the only legal state to sell to, but Nevada was fine with this. Now, um, outside of the state of Nevada, it was still politically popular to be anti-gambling and especially anti-slot machine. Police and politicians were often photographed destroying slot machines whenever they needed good press. New York City's Mayor LaGuardia had a photo opportunity on a barge dumping slot machines into the ocean. Many of the machines weren't even slot machines at all, but just common vending machines that the police had confiscated for the publicity stunt. Now, even with all the bad press, the operation of the slot machines was hard to stop. They, uh, except for the state of Nevada. In Nevada, in 1940, it had opened up its first resort hotel casino, the El Rancho Vegas, that had a bank of slot machines. Uh, by the time the Johnson Act came into effect, the, um, the Las Vegas Strip boom was well underway, and all of the casinos had slot machines. They originally put in slot machines to give the wives and girlfriends of the high rollers something to do and keep them busy, but the profitability of them was greatly underestimated. Slot machines now account for 70 to 80 percent of all Las Vegas casino profits. 30 percent of the profits from gambling machines come from what's known as problem gamblers. These are people with an impulse control disorder that uh, forces them to continue playing despite the ne negative and harmful effects to their lives. Now, over the years, many bells and whistles have been added to slot machines, both literally and figuratively. In 1964, the Bally Company was the first company to put out slot machines that, uh, that, uh, that were electric, and their machine had all kinds of new sound effects. It was also the first machine that had a hopper to catch your coins as they fell. Uh, machines that were made before the 1970s were routinely van uh, vandalized and uh, broken into and uh, compromised by people with even a basic knowledge of mechanics. Uh, the 1970s brought us microchip chip technology and random number generators. This, uh, the random number generators determines the spin outcome on the new machines. Now, uh, ooh, I almost had a stuff there. Almost. <laughs> The, um, as I said before, the machines were routinely compromised, and <clears throat> cheating the machines probably dates back to the time that they were first invented. Early slot cheats would use slugs or, or a string attached to the coin to make the machine think that it was receiving money when in fact it wasn't. Uh, when, the tech, when the machines were changed so that the, these devices no longer worked, a thing called a top-bottom joint was invented and was used by crooks for several years. When a guy who was fairly new at the slot cheat game, named Tommy Glenn Carmichael, was caught using one of these in the early 1980s, uh, he was sentenced to five years in prison. Now, this was a long time for him to sit in jail and think about how to uh, think about going straight, or to think about getting better at cheating. He chose the latter and began a 20-year battle with slot machine manufacturers and distributors uh, and casinos, taking them for millions of dollars. When he got out of prison, he bought a new slot machine and uh, invented a device called the monkey paw, or slider. This was something that he fed up through the payout chutes to trigger a switch inside and make the machine pay out on every pull. When the technology changed again so that this device was overcome, 
he went to a trade show that was offering the new, the, the new machines in 1991. While he was there, he met one of the engineers that designed the new machine. The engineer was so excited about his design that he not only answered all of Tommy's technical questions, but even opened up the machine and showed him how it worked inside. Within just a couple of minutes, Tommy knew exactly how to beat the machine. He bought one, took it home, and uh, within a few weeks had invented a device called the Light Wands. This is something that he shined inside the machine to blind the sensors and make the machine pay out. But the device was so successful for him that he not only used them himself, but actually marketed them to other slot cheaters. He made as much as $10,000 a day selling this device to other crooks. Uh, when he was eventually caught using one uh, in a sting operation, he was sentenced to a year in prison. And when he got out, again the technology had changed, so he invented two more devices called the hanger and the kickstand. These days, Tommy says he's done cheating slot machines, but that's probably because he's on the black book list and is not allowed to set foot in any casino. He's currently trying to market an anti-cheating device that he says could be attached to slot machines to keep people from cheating. But the casinos are wary and, and believe that the machine could easily be altered to help people cheat. Now, once the machines are installed in the casinos, the tampering with the computer programming on them is nearly impossible, unless you're a guy like, uh, like a guy named Ronald Harris, who worked for the Nevada Gaming Control Board. His job was to check the EEPROM chips in all the slot machines. The EEPROM stands for uh, Erasable Programmable Read-Only Memory. The two key words there are erasable and programmable, because that's what he did. He took, he took the chips out, erased their memory, and replaced it with his own programming. He then had his friends and relatives uh, win on the machines and split the, split the jackpots with him. By the time he was caught, he was charged with rigging over 24 jackpots throughout the state of Nevada. Now, um, what I'm about to tell you guys next is uh, I can only verify by my own personal uh, accounts. A magician friend of mine who lived and worked on, on uh, cruise ships for several years told me that uh, some of the cruise lines will set a few of the machines to win often on the early part of a long cruise. They do this for a couple of reasons. Uh, they do it especially if there's a problem on the ship like rough seas or a problem with the food. But if it's a long cruise they expect that the people will continue to come back and play or at the very least tell other people of their good fortune and those people will come in and bet. Now, uh, on my cruise to Bermuda, I walked through the casino as soon as we were in international waters and saw a machine that people seemed to be winning on fairly regularly. So after dinner, I came back, sat at the machine, and after about 20 minutes of winning and losing small amounts, a few dollars here and there, I won a big jackpot. Uh, later that night, the ship was rocking so bad that I couldn't sleep, so I went back to the casino, sat down at the same machine, and after just a few minutes, won another big jackpot for nearly twice what I had won earlier in the evening. Between the two jackpots, I paid for my entire cruise to Bermuda and had a really nice time. Now, uh, I've been told by casino managers that this type of thing just does not happen. But really, how difficult would it be to change out a couple of EEPROM chips or even entire machines in the middle of the night when they close the casino for cleaning? So, is it true? Did I just get lucky, as, the, as all the managers tell me? I don't know, but I had a, I had a nice time at Bermuda on them. So that's that's my presentation on slot machines. Next up, I'd like to tell you guys about dice. Now, dice have a very interesting history. According to archaeologists, they date back between four and 8,000 years, developed independently by different cultures at different times. Early dice were made up of various materials, including seashells, nuts, and stones, and were later replaced by animal knuckle bones. Uh, to, this day, the uh, the, the, to this day, the Arab word for knuckle bone is the same word that they use for dice. This is where the expression rolling the bones comes from, when people talk about playing dice. Now. Um, there's all different kinds of, of ways of rigging dice. I've got several different ones in my collection here. I've got some juice dice, some electric ones, some all side tappers, some weighted, some shapes, some doubles, flats, raised spots, trip dice, miss spots, all different kinds of rigged dice. And I have to be careful where I exhibit my collection because having any kind of rigged dice in your possession in the state of Nevada is a felony. But here in Chicago, I can show them off all I want. Now, uh, the ancient Romans believed that the outcome of a roll of dice was determined by Zeus's daughter, Fortuna. If the dice rolled in your favor, you were considered fortunate. Uh, 
Uh, Fortuna is known worldwide to gamblers as Lady Luck. If you are very fortunate, you could win a fortune. With so much depending on the outcome of a roll of dice, it's not surprising that as long as there have been dice players, there have been dice cheaters. People who use rigged dice might today be called a dice switcher or a dice mechanic. Now, uh, one of my favorite stories about a dice switcher is a guy that was never caught using switching the dice during the games. He used a secret compartment in his cane that he could switch the dice in and out whenever he wanted to. Uh, he was never caught using them at the table, but the way that he was caught was when he limped away from the table using his cane, he limped away on his left foot. When he had limped up to the table, he was limping on his right foot. And uh, one, of the, one of the pit bosses happened to notice this little discrepancy and says, hold on a minute, let's see what you've got there. And that's how he was cut. Now, um, there's, uh, there's all different things that you can do with dice. And cheating with dice probably dates back from early times. Uh, even, even with uh, regular dice, there are people that can use controlled throws. This means that they can throw the dice in a certain manner to make them pretty much land the way they want them to. Uh, and this, this practice dates back for a really long time. Uh, because of that practice, something like a dice cup was invented. Now the uh, thinking behind a dice cup was that it is if you're not actually touching the dice, you can't control what they do. That thinking would be wrong. Even with tiny dice, it's not that difficult to control what they do using a cup. Except for those two. So, <laughs> it's late and I haven't practiced in a week. <laughs> and I'll get those after the show. Fortunately, I have the whole theater to myself. So, uh, now, uh, after people found out that with a dice cup you could still make the dice do what you wanted them to, uh, a thing called a dice horn was invented, like this one from the early 1820s that, uh, that a dealer had found in the attic of an old farmhouse. This is a very old one. I also have a more modern one here. Now a good dice horn like this one uh, were very, could be very expensive and you could still get um, imitation ones that were made out of tin. This is where the expression tin horn comes from that you hear in a lot of old westerns. A tin horn gambler was somebody who had a cheap tin horn but pretended to be a man of means. Tin horn uh, eventually came to be known, uh, the, the, the expression tin horn came to be cheap imitation or someone posing as something that they weren't. The way a tin horn worked, or the way the, the dice horn works, is because of its beveled shape it also has little ridges inside. So when the dice are put in, they roll back and forth across the ridges and over the center bump, and you can't control the way they move around inside the, the horn. Now, uh, this works much the same way that a lip inside of a modern dice cup works. If you play uh, dice games nowadays, a lot of the dice cups have a lip in them. Now, uh, when, when the dice cup, uh, the, the next step after after a dice horn like this was uh, the in in invention of a dice cage, like this one used for a game called chuck a luck chuck a luck is a game that has three dice inside the cage. When the cage is spun, you see what numbers come up on the dice. And you bet on numbers one through six. If it comes up on one of the dice, you win, you win back what you had wagered. If you uh, if it comes up on two of the dice, you win twice your bet, and if it comes up on all three dice, you win three times what you bet. Now, at first glance, it sounds like the game is heavily in favor of the player, but if you do the math of all the possible combinations that can come up on the three dice, the house actually has nearly an 8% advantage in the game. Um, now, the game, uh, the, the game of chuck -a is is still played uh, you, you might find it in a casino, but most casinos have banned the game. Uh, you, you may also see it at carnivals or fundraisers. Now, another game that's played the same way as Chuck Luck is a game called Crown and Anchor. This is a game that's still played throughout Europe. It's a, more of a pub game in England than uh, anything else, but it was played widely throughout World War II. 
Uh, and it's played exactly the same way as Chuck Luck, but instead of numbers on the dice, you have the four card suits, clubs, diamonds, spades, and hearts, along with a crown and an anchor. But it's got the same odds and the same way of playing. Now there is a game that uh, can be played with a, a Chuck Luck cage that does play the same way, uh, called Grand Hazard. Now Grand Hazard's played exactly the same as Chuck Luck, except that it's got a more complex table layout, and even worse odds for the player. Now, um, Grand Hazard is not to be confused with the Game of Hazard. The Game of Hazard is, the, uh, fall, is, is, is where the game of craps comes from. Hazard was an English pub game that was very popular and uh, was brought to the United States by French economists around the time of the Louisiana Purchase. Now, if you see, uh, the, the, uh, in, in, the, in the game of Hazard, if you got uh, a losing roll after the come out roll, it was called crabs. When the French economists brought it to the United States, they mispronounced crabs as crepes. And the American Negro mispronounced crepes as craps. Now, craps was much more of a back alley game in the South than its dignified father Hazard. Uh, if you ever, uh, if you want to play craps today, you can play it uh, not only like that, but you can also play it in casinos. If you decide to play craps in a casino, you want to stick to the outer edges of the table. The pass, don't pass lines uh, are, are your best bets. Anything in the middle of the table has really lousy odds, and the serious gamblers avoid the middle of the table like the plague. If you see a guy sitting, uh, betting, betting heavily on the middle of the table going, Hey, come on, uh, ate the hard way, baby needs a new pair of shoes. Chances are good that his kid does need new shoes because his father's an idiot. Now the best bet that you can make after the come out roll is the don't pass bet. Uh, that means, odds wise, that's the best bet you're, you can make. But what that means is that you are betting that the thrower is going to lose. Now, um, even though odds wise that's the smart way to play, the other people at the table don't like you. They consider you a wrong better, and you don't. And you, if you decide to be a wrong better, you don't want to keep. You want to keep a low profile. You don't want to be cheering your win when everybody else is losing, or you'll have a really bad situation in a real short period of time. Now, uh, other basic advice if you're playing on a craps table is you don't want to interact with the other people playing. Usually, craps players are a very superstitious bunch, and they like to keep to themselves. Uh, you also, uh, if, you're, if you're a man and it's your first time at a craps table, you don't want to let on because it's considered bad luck for the table. Uh, it's opposite though if you're a woman. Uh, a woman whose first time at the craps table is considered lucky. So that's my presentation on dice. And let's see here. One more thing. I like that so much. <laughs> Next up, I'm going to tell you about a game called Poker. I know you guys like poker. You a big poker player yourself? Not really. Not really? Well, poker, although largely an American game, dates back to, um, gets its origins from a game called Prime from around 1500 in Northern Europe. That game developed over the next 200 years into a bluffing game uh, in Germany called Puchin. Uh, and that led to the development of a French game called Pouok, spelled P-O-Q-U-E. Now when Pouok was brought to the United States uh, in the early 1800s, around the time of the Louisiana Purchase, um, it was uh, Pouok, uh, with all the mixed dialects in New Orleans, became polka. And as, uh, by the 1830s, the game had developed into the modern, it was adapted to the modern 52 card deck game that we play today. And as it moved north and west, polka picked up a, the, the unstressed syllable in polka picked up an R, making it poker. Now the best hand of poker I ever saw that was dealt by a guy named Ping O'Sullivan. He was Chinese Irish. He had bright red hair with no peripheral vision, but he could sure play cards. And what he did was he took out a deck of cards, he shuffled them, he had the person to his right cut the cards. Would you mind cutting the cards for me? He completed the, the cut, and he dealt out seven hands of five-card stud. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. When the deal came around to him the first time, he did something a little tricky. He took one off the bottom. Now the guy across the table thought he saw something, so he kept watching him, but the next time around, he didn't do it. So he watched him real close, and sure enough, Ping took another one off the bottom. Now just as he's finishing his deal and looking at his cards, the, guys around, the guy across the table from him says, Wait a minute, I thought I saw you do, doing something funny when you were shuffling, or when you were dealing. Oh, well, Ping, he didn't want to have a problem. He says, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll bury my cards in the bottom of the deck. I'll even bury another whole hand. And if you guys all like the cards you have, I'll just take the next five off the top. Well, that seemed fair to the guys around the table because they did like the cards they had. So he took his five cards. One, two, three, four, five. In fact, those guys really liked the cards they had. This guy over here, he had a full house. Sixes and queens. This guy over here, he also had a full house, aces and eights. Now that's the dead man's hand. It's called the dead man's hand because while Bill Hickok was holding this hand of cards when he was shot in the back playing poker. Over here, this guy also had a full house. He had tens and threes. Over here, this guy had Jackson five. Remember the Jackson five from the 70s? Over here, we have uh, nines and nines over twos. Another full house. As a matter of fact, every one of those guys around the table had a full house. This guy had queens and sevens. Now, uh, holding a full house and five card stud, nobody is willing to fold. And before you knew it, everybody kept betting and raising and betting and raising. And before you knew it, everybody had gone all in on the first hand of poker. It was unheard of, but it happened. And everybody showed their full house, and Pink showed his five cards. Now, his first card was not a great card, a seven of clubs. When you follow that with the eight, the nine, the ten, and the jack, a straight flush, well, that's the best hand of cards I ever saw dealt. Now, if I could just figure out how he did it, now, I'm not a religious man, but I do prefer to close the show with the age-old gambler's prayer. It goes something like this. Dear Lord, please let me break even. I really need the money.